how to make good decisions. If you open a book in philosophy, in economics, in psychology, you most likely encounter the following message. Good decisions follow the laws of logic, the calculus of probability, the maximization of utility. If you're not doing that, you will be recorded in the section on cognitive errors. Um, statistical theory, probability theory, is a beautiful theory, but it does not describe how every one of us makes decisions, and not even how those who write these books make decisions, as the following story illustrates. A professor from Columbia University had an offer to a rival university. It was Harvard, and he could not make up his mind. Should he accept, should he reject, should he leave, should he stay? A colleague took him aside and asked, what's wrong with you? Just maximize your expected utility. You're always writing about that. Exasperated, the professor responded, come on, this is serious. I would like to invite you today in a journey into the world of decision making and also the world of rationality. Uh, the key message will be that there's more than the expected utility calculus, the statistical calculus. There are more tools. And the key distinction will be between the risk, that means a world where you know all the probabilities or can estimate them reliably, all the alternatives, and all the consequences, and also can reasonably assume that the world will not change at all. And a world of uncertainty, where not of all of that is known. So, here is, okay, there's some surprises. Yeah? This is the world of uncertainty. <laughs> The uh, slide didn't look so when I had it originally, but there is something. Let's do with that. So uh, risk decisions are when you, uh, when you go in the casino this evening and play the roulette, you're in a world of risk. You can calculate how much you will lose in the long run. But in many situations, you're in a world of uncertainty where only some things can be calculated, but not everything. Whom should you marry? You can't know all the alternatives and all the consequences. There will be surprises. Which job to take? Where to invest? And we too often take and assume that the world would really be predictable and use an optimization calculus and behave like Soviet Union five-year plans and then fail because we do not know anything else. This talk will be much more about uncertainty. So how should we make good decisions when we do not know whether the future is like today? And in these situations, uh, one tool that's important, and I will only talk about this one, are heuristics. Heuristics are simple rules that not only can be uh, implemented much quicker, but also, and I will try to explain it to you, you can show that under certain, in certain situations they will actually do better than a complex analysis of everything. This will be one of the key things I will try to convey to you. So here's the challenge. You have this amount of information and a complicated algorithm, say a log logistic regression. But you are in a world of uncertainty. You need to predict the future hmm, rather than predict the past. Hmm. Now you take a subset of this information and a simple algorithm, and there are quite a number of situations, and we'll specify them, where you will make better predictions with less. That's the challenge. The challenge is often not seen because in many disciplines, 
people have the data first, and then they fit the model, such a regression, on the data. And you always win if you have more free parameters. But that's not science. That's hindsight. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that you construct a model from some part of the data and predict the future. And in that case, you are in a world of uncertainty, and here, often less is more. Mm -hmm. So another message today will be that heuristics are not what you may have read, second best. And the sign, those of you who rely on heuristics do this because they have a kind of mental problem. No, you will see that very simple heuristics can actually lead to better situations in the real world, not in your artificial problem that you constructed. Okay? So, um, that ends up in a vision that you need at least two classes of tools. One is statistics, logic, but the other one are heuristics. And one should not make statements that the one or the other is better. It's like a toolbox. If the problem is a nail, you need to have a hammer. If it's a screw, you need not use your hammer. And there is no universal tool. Even if we want to believe that there would be one kind of rationality. So my belief is rationality is a toolbox. And wisdom is to know from experience what tool to choose. And we actually can analyze that in more detail. So that's a kind of summary of the talk. If, I hope I can make some of you sleepless, <laughs> that you worry. And if you worry this night about what I've said here, yeah, that was a good reason why I took the trip and came to here. <laughs> so this is the first distinction between risk and uncertainty. It's an old distinction, and you find it in Frank Knight's classic book on risk, uncertainty, and profit, making the case in economics that if you live in a world of risk where everyone knows all the distributions of everything and everyone else, there is no profit. Profit is being made when there is real uncertainty, when you, when you take ri yeah, risk in another sense <laughs> than the one here. Okay, but that distinction has been lost in many areas because of the idea that rationality would be just of one kind. The second distinction I want to make, let's see how this one comes up. Okay. This is just my surprise, yeah, because always something happens. Yeah, and I was looking it through with him here, and now it's different. Yeah, so. But at least the text is there. So the difference is between as if models and process models. There are an as if model is a model that is supposed to uh, make good predictions, but not to describe how people really make predictions. For instance, most economists think about expected utility maximization as as if. So if you find out that you yourself do something different, that doesn't falsify the model, because it's as if. Clear? It's supposed to make good predictions about your behavior, not about your mental processes, not about your actual... It's an important distinction. Um, my own bias is to prefer process models. I want to know how people make distinction, hmm? what it's going in their, on their hearts. Hmm? So and a process model can be falsified twice. If it doesn't predict behavior, but also if it doesn't predict the process. And you can do this if you have a model, where, for instance, for a doctor, and say that the diagnosis is based on 10 uh, different variables, which are somehow weighted, and the doctor only looks at one, then the model is falsified on the process, not on the outcome. Clear? And in my feeling, uh, science progresses from as if model to process models. So Ptolemy's model of the movement of heavenly bodies with the earth in the middle and everyone in circles and epicircles is not a process model. 
And very few people would have believed that the planets do this uh, extra circles. But it predicted extremely well. It's as if. And Kepler's models are meant as a process to describe how the movement actually is. It's still a model because things always do something slightly different than we think. Okay, that's the second distinction. And <clears throat> so, in economics, the classical defense by Milton Friedman of as-if models, and as you should know that for an economist, a process model is something that, for the typical economists, of course not those who are here, uh, a process model is a sign of weakness, hmm? An as-if model is a sign of strength in the sense that the as-if models are not arbitrary. Uh, you use one conventional kind of mathematics, the differential calculus type of mathematics, and try to model everything with that. That's what's done. And it's an optimization model, and if you don't come up with an optimization model, then it may not be considered to be economics. So these kinds of ideas here are often vetted into the self-identity of entire disciplines. The uh, Friedman defended when one found out that you know, people are not really doing the expected utility calculus is in a very ingenious way. He said, all that matters is prediction. Okay? Now, there many fields got into a problem, and I illustrate this with economics. Um, in, uh, in rational choice in economics means that you have a certain risk function, so a utility function. And of course, you can, if you have the data already there, you can always fit an expected utility model, and it will always win. But the question is, does it actually predict? as Friedman made it the criterion. And I'll just give you um, two quotes, two very recent quotes, where people have tried to systematically analyze whether your risk function or your utility function and his utility function will actually predict your next choice or his next choice. And here's the answer that came out well. Um, so the utility function can be income functions, can be prospect theory functions, can be wealth functions, anything. Yeah? And the book by Friedman uh, concluded that the power to predict out of sample, out of sample is one kind of uncertainty. You, in the simplest case, you divide all your data into two halves, you fit your model in one and predict the other one. Or you predict next day's behavior. Anyhow, something that you do not already know. And it is in the, so the predictability is in the poor to non-existent range. And uh, we have seen no convincing victory of naive alternatives. So this is a damning sign for the only one goal, prediction. So if they are right, then the standard model of how people make decisions, classical decisions here, is descriptively wrong. That has nobody ever doubted but it's also wrong in prediction. And I want to, the, the, the second uh, quote gives the same thing. So anyhow, there are some empirical problems, and I want to give you an alternative. I have no doubt that uh, good statistical models will uh, predict in certain areas, but the moment you deal with uncertainty, it gets more complex. And I will not talk to about today about risk and models for predictable situations, but about uncertainty. Out of sample prediction is the, the minimum type of uncertainty. So, um, <clears throat> I'll try to explain now what a heuristic is. I'll give you one example. In general, a heuristic is a, a simple rule and the art uh, of heuristic decision making is to focus on the important variables and ignore all the rest. That's maybe a short description. Yeah? Anyone who does this has, until maybe 10 years ago, be accused 
of having a mental problem, so cognitive limitations and so on. Yeah? Forget that. We are now farther. And I give you now one example that illustrates that experts use heuristics in order to make better decision making, not only fast decision making, but also more accurate decision making. I take the example from sports. Is any one of you playing baseball? Hands up. Nobody. Cricket? Nobody. Soccer? In Turin? Huh? Okay. Three. Good. Hmm. Assume a ball comes in high. And an experienced player knows immediately where to run to catch or stop the ball. How does he or she know? What is the process? that's going on. Now, have you ever interviewed a soccer player? Then you will probably get the answer, don't know. It's intuitive and it's intuition. It is intuition. Intuition is defined as something that you can't do very well, but you can't explain it. But how does it work? What's the explanation? Now, here are two kinds of theories much more general than the example I'm giving you. One theory is it's a very complex problem. There's wind, there's all kinds of things that influence the trajectory. So one needs a complex solution. The other a few is it is a problem under high uncertainty. Therefore, we should look for a simple solution, a simple heuristic. See this? OK. Now, let's go f for the first alternative. That's what the typical view is, a uh, complex solution. I got you a quote from uh, Richard Dawkins' wonderful book and famous book, but that's something where he got it wrong. Hmm? And he says, when a man throws a ball high in the air, and so he behaves as if he had solved a set of differential equations in his head. Basically, uh, estimating the trajectory of the ball. That's what I mean. Note that he puts the term as if in. He knows exactly that we certainly don't know how to do it, or the unconscious will also not know how to do it, but what else could it be? So that's basically economic theory here. Um, have you ever calculated the trajectory of a ball. That's how it works. And the problem is not the computation. That's often confused. So we not suffer from computational limits. The problem is the estimation. Everyone today, or even in the brain, could be something computation implemented. But you need to estimate the initial angle in order to get the trajectory. You need to estimate all the other things. You may have G, the gravitation confidence, uh, in, in your genes. Yeah? So that's not the problem. The problem is to estimate the initial angle, yeah? the, the wind that's coming. Yeah? And actually, I've given you a simplified formula, which has no wind in it, yeah? no direction, no speed, no uh, speed of wind, also no spin. But that's the typical solution. There's a complex problem, and we assume that people would behave as if they would solve these com complex solutions. Hmm? That's where you find Milton Friedman's own example about the billiard player. He argues this way. Hmm? We don't even have to care what the billiard player does. What will he do? S solve a complex or behave as if he would solve this solution. If Milton Friedman would have been a baseball player, he might have seen the light. So, let's go on. We know from a number of experiments that experienced uh, players do something different. Namely, they use a set of simple heuristics. I'll show you the simplest one, which works when the ball is already high up in the air. It's called the gaze heuristic. It has three components. So many heuristics have a number of components. First one is uh, fixate your eye on the ball, start running, and then adjust your running speed so that the angle of gaze remains constant. So this player, 
does exactly that. He is running in a way so that the angle of gaze remains constant. And then watch what happens. He will be exactly there where the ball is coming down. Do you want to see it again? The point is that the real player can ignore all the variables that you have seen in the equation and also those which are left out. By focusing on only one variable, the angle of gaze, and then the problem is solved. This is an example of a heuristic. It does the job faster. It is less subject to computational errors. And it actually solves the problem. There is no robot today who can do the calculations in time. And I should emphasize again, the, the problem is not the calculation, but the estimations that go into this. Thing. And the estimation are one of the key reasons why heuristics are successful, because they avoid the estimations. So, uh, the gaze heuristic is also used by, um, by animals, so it seems to have evolved. If you have a dog at home, throw a frisbee and watch your dog. You will see the dog is not trying to calculate the trajectory. But it will run in a way to keep the optical angle constant, and then it will be there where the ball is coming down. If you are a sailor, and you know situations where a sailboat is coming, you fear collision, you will not calculate uh, your trajectory and estimate the other trajectory and see whether there's an intersection point in three-dimensional space. No. You will, use, will be trained to use the same heuristic. Yeah? You face the other boat, and if the angle remains constant, then just go away. Huh? There will be a collision. Here you want to avoid it. Here you want to get it. In our research, we analyze the rules, heuristics that underlie good intuitions. Like these players have good intuitions where they go, but they don't know how it works. In order to make them explicit and teach them, others, in order to make decisions. Here is an example. You may remember the miracle on the Hudson River. A plane took off in LaGuardia Airport, and after a few minutes, something totally unexpected happened. A group of Canadian geese collided with the plane. The engines of modern jets, there are two more seats here for those who are standing in the, that's you, yeah? And there are a few more here. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence that when standing, you comprehend better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's more here. Mm -hmm. OK. The jets of modern engines are made in a way that, so that they can digest birds, but not Canadian geese. They're too fat. And the improbable happened that the keys flew in both engines. The engines then shut down. It became silent in the plane. We know from the reports of the uh, passengers that there was no panic. There was only prayer. And the two pilots turned around and had to make a decision about life and death. Will they uh, get back to the airport? There were actually two around. or? will they have to make a much more risky decision, like going into the water? How did they find out? Did they use all the computational equipment in the plane to calculate their trajectory, so their sailing trajectory? No. They used the same heuristic here, and they are trained to use it. In that case, where you sail, it goes the following way. You, uh, the pilots face um, a point, say the tower of the uh, airport through the windshield. And if the tower goes up in the windshield, you won't make it. See that? And that can be done quick, fast, and leaves them time for doing the, 
the other type of work, yeah? the calculative work, like going through all these uh, checklists which I never had time to finish. So here's an illustration how of a program that we are following. We interview or we work experimentally with experts, get out the heuristic rules that underlie good intuitions, teach them. So the same thing can be done with leadership and other areas, but I'm not going today in this. So, um, <clears throat> now let me go in the abstraction. What I have uh, communicated so far, there's a distinction between theories of decision making, those who deal with situations of risk, and those who also deal with situations of uncertainty. Classical decision making is only geared to situations of risk, and then you choose your problems accordingly, namely mostly things like choice between monetary gambles, where everything is known, including the probabilities. That's the first distinction. The second distinction is as if versus you want to look in the process. With these two distinctions in mind, uh, you can understand the differences between the three existing visions about what bounded rationality is. It's not of one kind. It's of at least three completely different kinds. Um, the first one is the vision that bounded rationality is optimization under constraints. Ask an economist, most likely you will get this answer. That means it is still optimization, but you include a few constraints, either maybe budgetary constraints that you have no money or a cognitive limitation or whatever you want. And of course you can only exclude a few because otherwise the mathematics gets too difficult. Uh, note that this was never Herbert Simon's idea, who is credited with the name. I have a quote up here. The study of bounded rationale is not the study of optimization in relation to task environments. Uh, Herb once told me that he wanted to sue people who misused his term bounded rationale for optimization under constraints. He never did. So, uh, but this is the reigning um, interpretation, and I give you a citation here from Kenneth Error, a Nobel laureate in economics, and this is from the book on the late Herbert Simon, where he still maintains that. The second interpretation of bounded rationality is the typical one that psychologists learn. It is almost the opposite. That's uh, it's about cognitive illusion. No, this is about rationality. It's a more complicated rationality. And this is more about irrationality. So uh, this is Kahneman's work. It's about uh, exploring the systematic biases that separate the beliefs that people have from uh, optimal beliefs and rational agent models. Although this looks diametrically opposed. It is not. It's only descriptively diametrically opposed. So the economists think on average people are rational and that's what bounded rationality means. And Kahneman thinks on average they are more irrational. But Kahneman accepts the same norms as at least he thinks economists do. So it's always a deviation from rational, from something else. In that interpretation, psychology can, psychology departments can be closed. Hmm? Once people think statistically all the time and logically all the time, because psychology has nothing to say about rationality. That's not my view, but that's the implication of this view. Okay, but that's the dominant program and people look for cognitive illusions of, of, of every one of us. Um, and then there are even political uh, implications. Uh, for instance, if you read Thaler and Sunstein's book on nudging, yeah, then you will basically get the following message. Huh? Uh, this research has shown that people lack rationality. They avoid the term irrational. Yeah? So be careful, lack rationality apparently something different. And 
Apparently, research has also shown that there is no hope for us. We cannot learn. Thus, the state has to step in and nudge us. It's a new form of paternalism. In the 21st century, that's where we got. That's not my vision. And we have shown in many experiments that either these cognitive illusions aren't any illusions in the first place, or maybe illusions of the researchers. Or if something is there, you can quickly uh, uh, get people to think and learn. So for instance, just one example, the famous money pump that's always cited. There's no evidence for money pump in the real world. And if you get someone in, in a pump, this person will be out immediately. So just to make that clear. The third uh, vision is a different one. That's the vision, the original vision by Herbert Simon. And this is the vision that we try to flesh out and this talk will about, be about. The difference is here, this is about as if, and that's not about as if, so the Kahneman people that try to model, not really model, but have words like availability or something. Yeah? And uh, we, we make models of, of heuristics, so formal models that can be tested, can be analyzed, and where you can see where it works. Second, uh, that's the difference between as if process. And the difference between risk and uncertainty so these models are typical about risk, and most of that is at least assumed to be also about risk. Because in a world where uncertainty is, you do not know what the best answer is. Yeah? But uh, my dear colleagues in this field, they always know what's right, and we are wrong. So. And uh, third, very important, the rationality here is what we call ecological rationality. Herbert Simon had this metaphor of a pair of scissors. One blade is cognition, that would be our heuristics or strategies. The other blade is the environment. And rationality is defined as the match between the two. So you always need to analyze the task, the environment, in order to find out what is a good strategy here? So it's not about consistency. And it's not about the ideal there would be one tool, like base rule, would be always rational. No. Base rule is not always rational. You need to find out when. So we go a step further, and that's called ecological rationality. You will get some details. OK, are you still up? Yeah. Now the challenge comes. So the program has three uh, directions. The first one is descriptive. We, are, we ask, can we identify the heuristics that you use in your social life for cooking, in investment, and other things? A simple rule is just do what, what everyone else do. Why did you come to this talk? Because the others came. It's not so stupid. And the, um, that's the descriptive thing. Uh, you have the gaze heuristic studying it would come in under that. But there is a normative study associated, that's ecological rationality. So in what environment can we identify it? Where we can say that a heuristic that uses only one good reason cannot be outperformed. So that's the type of question. Huh? And finally, since this type of uh, work directly connects to the real world, because we study real experts and real people, um, we use it to design heuristic strategies and also design environments for doctors, for uh, business people, and for other people in the real world outside. So that's an engineering program here. The heuristics and biases program uh, is looking here into the, um, uh, they don't use adaptive toolbox, but they have several heuristics, although uh, with the early exceptions from Tversky, like elimination by aspect, they're never formally defined. 
They used to post hoc explain almost everything. Yeah? And, but they have no, this question would never be asked in the heuristic and biases program because statistic or logic is always better. And engineering, you can do very little with this type of words. So we'll, in a way, we try to flesh out both Simons and help to go beyond the heuristics and biases program and make psychology and economics a little bit more useful. Good. So we'll start with the adaptive toolbox. And um, I give you here just first a list of uh, heuristics that are based on several cognitive capacities, like recognition, tracking, trust, equal division, and one good reason. You saw one good reason before that it's the gaze heuristic. It's just one good reason. You pay attention to only one thing. And I'll give you now an example for equal division. So, imagine you want to invest money. So you inherited a large sum and you want to diversify, not to put everything in one basket, but how? Don't ask your bank advisor. Huh? That's a possibly bad idea because they're instructed to tell you to invest so that the bank profits most. Yeah? So that's not a good heuristic. Hmm? So the sounds like it's a very complicated problem. Huh? Uh, Harry Markowitz from the University of Chicago has gotten the Nobel Prize in Economics for finding the solution. It's called the mean variance model. Hmm? For those of you who have studied business or finance, you all know this. Huh? This is like... Uh, You've been brought up of this for the others. Um, again, it's not the calculations here, so this expected uh, return of some of these options. It's not the calculations, it's the estimations. So for each option, you want to diversify, you have more options, you need to estimate the future return, the variance, and the entire covariance matrix, because they are dependent. So the more options you have, it goes up exponentially in terms of the variables you have to estimate. This is the problem. It's not computational limits, as we always hear. So, but the situation is now resolved. And many banks and finance departments, they just teach that. Do we have someone here from finance at the University of Turin? No, economics? Yeah, you all know that. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Now, do you know the following? When Harry Markowitz made his own investment for the time after his retirement, then he used his Nobel Prize winning optimization model. So we might think, no, he did not. He used a simple heuristic called 1 over n. That means allocate your money equally. So if you have only two options, you do 50-50. Three, a third, a third, a third. There's no weighing. You don't even try to estimate anything. It's clear why it's a heuristic. Huh? It just ignores. It doesn't try to make all these estimations. The question is, how good is that? If you read behavioral economics, you will find a few authors who tell you, why do people do that? There's no doubt that many people do this. Because yeah, they have these cognitive limitations. Yeah, and you have to agree, you will not be able to do the Markowitz calculations. Or Do you do this? Good. Um, but again, as we'll see, it's not the problem is not the calculations at all. It's the estimations. So. The real way to approach that is, think about the distinction between risk and uncertainty. The Markowitz model is made for a world of risk where you know everything. But how does it work in the real world of investment, which is a world of uncertainty? As you may have noticed since at least 2007. And that can be easily tested. I'll give you one example. In one study, there were seven investment problems. One of them 
um, invest your money into 10 uh, US industrial funds. With the Markowitz model, you need to estimate all these parameters. You need also many years of data. In this case, uh, there were 10 years of stock data. 1 over n, you're done. It ignores all the data. It's a very extreme, there's no free parameter. So, what was the result? So this was a study where you had to predict yeah, the future, not the past. And in six out of the seven cases, one over n made more money than the Markowitz optimization model using the standard uh, criteria like Sharpe ratio and so on. How can that be? That will be one of the key topics of this talk. And I'll give you now uh, the first reasons. I'll go stepwise. The, the very first reason was the distinction between risk and uncertainty. The moment you're in a world of uncertainty, everything can happen. Now we go a little bit closer. Here are three properties as dichotomies that can tell you when to use a complex model like mean variance or a simple heuristic. If you are in a situation with low uncertainty, that means the world is stable and predictable. And you have only a few alternatives. In that case, maybe just two or three or four or five options. And lots of data, like 10 years in this case, um, or more, then make it complex. That's the world of optimization. That's the world of big data. But if you deal with problems of that kind, you need different class of tools. So that is, if there is high uncertainty, as in the stock market, if you have many alternatives and relatively small amounts of data, then make it simple. That's the world of heuristics. This is now purely qualitative. Well, uh, get more into quantitative. You can do now the following simple uh, quantitative simulation. Um, you're still in the world of stock market, and you ask yourself, you have 50 alternatives. How many years of stock data would you need so that the Markowitz model will finally, at least likely, get better than the simple heuristic? Remember that in this study, 10 years of stock data was too little. So what do you think? How many years of stock data would you need so that the complex calculations finally can be expected to do better than the simple heuristic? 12 years? 15? Hmm? 100 is a good guess. You only can answer this question with computer simulation. The best estimate is 500 years. So in the year 2500, people can stop relying on simple heuristic, in that case, and do the calculations, provided the same stocks are still around in the stock market in the first place. Do our banks understand this connection? So this is connection, this is called ecological rationality. If two classes of tools, optimization tools, uh, heuristics, and you specify the world in which the one work and the other works. So one is a nail, the other one is a, the world is a screw. So do our banks understand that important distinction, that these, these calculations work hmm, uh, in that world, but not over here? Um, I show you a letter from my own internet bank that all customers got. It's in German, but I translate. You might test your own bank. It says, with Nobel Prize winning strategy to success in investment. And then the letter read, uh, do you know Harry Markowitz? No. And then the story was told that um, you, we Germans, like you Italians, have no idea of stocks. And the story was told that he won the Nobel Prize. And the bank is now using the strategy, a little bit late, but nevertheless. Huh? And there was a warning about your two simplistic ideas about how to invest your money. 
What this bank has not understood is that I sent the letter 500 years too early. So, uh, let's skip that. So let me go now deeper into ecological rationality. The, uh, okay. the, um, so this is the quote from Herbert Simon about the scissors. And I'll show you now the typical um, reason why people use heuristic, typically in the sense that you will probably read this in your textbooks, and it's not correct, uh, is because it's called the accuracy effort trade-off. So people use heuristics because uh, they, it saves effort, but they have to pay a price for that in accuracy. That's the typical story. You find this almost everywhere. Certainly the heuristics and bias program is built on it. In that theory, that you would do something with less effort and get more accuracy is not thinkable. So if you would have a regression and throw out huh, all parts except the first one and then make better prediction that cannot be. But you've just seen a few examples that it can be. And uh, the underlying philosophy is that the total error in prediction you make consists of a bias and a noise. Noise is the, the kind of measurement error. We cannot do anything about that. And bias, this is all what the heuristic and biases program is about, is something in your brain that makes you ignore. Or a classical definition of bias is if the world is a parable and you have a linear regression, then you have a bias. There's nothing to do about that. Clear? So, uh, that's correct all in a world of risk where you know everything, but it's not correct in a world of uncertainty. In a world of uncertainty, the total error has one more component, and that's called the bias variance trade off. The total error is bias as before, we just square it here, noise as before, but there's a new term that's called variance. Variance means huh, that you make estimation error. Or more precisely, if you have different samples, you arrive at different estimates for your parameters. So think back at the Markowitz mean variance versus the 1 over n heuristic. 1 over n, does it, uh, do, has it a, a bias? Probably yes. Huh? because the end will not be as flat. Does it cause error by variance? No, it cannot, because it doesn't estimate any parameter. See that? Markowitz modeling has probably a smaller bias. It will have some bias, but it will cause lots of variance. So variance, this is, uh, you can decrease variance if you increase the sample size, like did before, from 10 years to 500 years. Yeah? That's a measure to con make that small. Hmm. That, that's maybe the most important equation that I'll show you today. And don't do much mathematics. Hmm. The, and it's important to understand. And when you got that point, then you can see that you can have both. You can save effort and be more accurate. Here's an example. Assume you want to, um, to model the temperature in London. And I gave you here the data for the year 2000. Every point is an average temperature, average daily temperature. And there are two polynomials fitted. One is a three degree polynomial that doesn't do very much. Huh? And the other one is a 12 degree polynomial, which can fit much better. Now, which one has the better fit? Yeah, 12 degree polynomial, that's clear. The more complex you make it, the better the fit. And you can see this by a simple thought. If you have a polynomial of the degree 364, you can fit perfectly. 
There will be no error left. But that's all hindsight. That's not what science is about. Now, what happens if we predict with these fitted polynomials next year's weather? Or if we take samples where we fit this and predict the entire, it doesn't matter so much. So we do any type of either out of sample prediction or predicting next year's. What happens? So here is the uh, situation. This is the error. Huh? Low is better. This is not good. That's the degree of polynomial. So the complexer, you saw a 12 degree and a 3 degree. This is the error. So it goes down. And as we know now, it will some, sometimes get to zero. This is the fitting curve. And you see in many publications only data fitting. That's not a good test of a theory. How will the prediction curve look like? So we now say we're predicting next years based on all these fitted polynomials. Will it, maybe you start with a simple question, will be the prediction curve, will it be above or below this fitting curve? What do you think? So this is, will it have more error or less error? Shouldn't be so difficult. I mean, just use a social heuristic. Huh? I left so much space over here. <laughs> it must be there. Hmm? And the, the, the reason is that prediction is more difficult than explaining what you already know. So it must be here, it makes more error. But the important question is what shape does it have? Is it also the case that it's, so the more complex the model is, the uh, lower the error will get? Or has it a different shape? Yeah, you got it already. It has a very different shape, it's U-shaped. That means, here is a model for temperature. This is a one degree polynomial, it's a line, which is not a good model for London. May work on the equator, but not in London. Huh? So it has a big error. And the moment you make it more complex, error goes down, up to here. And then it goes up, and much faster. So a 12 degree polynomial, the one you saw before, hmm, creates more error than a totally false model. Why? This one, a, a line, has a high bias but a low variance. You only estimate two parameters, we have a line. Yeah? And that one over here has a much lower bias but a high variance. Here you have an example that a simple model, even if it's totally wrong, can predict better because it reduces estimation error. See that? And uh, so if you see a publication where someone tests models, always look closely. Is it fitting or prediction? And it's not the same. So if you would just do fitting, you would conclude this is the best model. If you do prediction, you would conclude this is the worst model. So here is another depiction of the same idea, and I want to get this in your minds. Now assume these are two dart boards, and in the middle is the bullseye. That's where you want to be. Here is a player who consistently throws left down. The bias is, in this game, the difference, the distance between the bullseye and the average dart. Clear? This one has a low variance. Another player, this one here, has no bias. On average, if you average all of this, it's exactly in the middle, but has a trembling hand. So, uh, lots of variance. And that illustrates that first the issue is not bias. It's always both. And that actually, if you just would count these scores, 
this one does better. Although this one has no bias. See that? In other words, any brain who wants to be able to survive in an uncertain world has to have a bias. And the bias is nothing you should get rid of. But you need to have a balance between bias and variance. And uh, this is a way to, I think, to understand it. And here are some ways uh, that heuristics can reduce variance by including some bias. So one is to, um, to stay away from estimating any weights. And that's the equal weights. You have seen an example, it's Markowitz. And you've seen that he can do better under specified conditions than the entire optimization model. Uh, the, this is also something that we study. I, I, I have a program with the Bank of England. On, it's called Simple Heuristics for a Safer World for Banking. You can look that up in the internet. It's with Andy Haldane, who is the uh, head of the uh, financial security. And where we investigate very simple rules that can do better. I don't know how much you worry about fin the next financial crisis, but we know the last one. Uh, all these methods that rating agencies used, uh, or the banks used to calculate their own capital ratios, value at risk and its variance, could not predict any crisis and prevent none. Why is this the case? I think you're starting to understand now, we are not in a world of risk where these models are made for, we are a world of uncertainty and things happen in this crisis. What else could you do? And these, by the way, value at risk computation that your bank is doing, that every bank has to do because of the uh, central, uh, the European regulations, hmm? yeah? These calculations border on astrology. I give many talks to banks and I've never found a single person, and including those who do the calculation, who would, who would not accept that statement. But what they say is, but we, ha we have no choice. We have to do it. So they do senseless calculations, which is actually part of the problem, not solving it. What's the alternative? So I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, once over dinner, I asked Mervyn King, that was the last uh, um, yeah, uh, president of the, uh, uh, the Bank of England, uh, what are the handful of heuristics that would make our world of finance safer? Mervyn said, start with one. No leverage ratio above 10 to 1. For the non-financial people, that leverage ratio is about the debts you have. Hmm? to the capital you have. And before the crisis, some banks had 50 to 1, 60 to 1, or even more. So this is a simple rule that doesn't try to predict anything, but it builds a dam. And leverage ratio is an unweighted leverage ratio, so it's a class of the, of the equal weights thing. Why? So the typical answer we, uh, response we get, but you, you have to differentiate between the various things. Yeah? Of course, yes, if you could, do it. Yeah? But in this world, the estimations of the weights will be you know, hot air. So just don't do it. And also, the moment you're not estimating all these weights and including all the covariance matrix, hmm, then the banks can no longer fumble around as easily. They always can game or try to game, but if a regulation is simple, the regulators can see it more easily. And that would really put safety back but we are not as far. We still have Basel III, and there will be most likely a Basel IV after we find out that Basel III will never, and will be even more complex. Basel I had 30 pages, Basel II had 300 pages, Basel III had over 600 pages, and it will go on. It's going in the wrong direction. We need to simplify. We need to realize that in a complex world, we need simple rules, not more complex ones. Okay, uh, one reason heuristics is another example. 
and lexicographic heuristics, so sequential heuristics, the last one. That will be my uh, last example. Again, this thing, so lexicographic is, uh, for instance, uh, in the Olympic Games, uh, which country won? No, typically the one who has most gold medals. And only if they tie, then the silver medals count. That's lexicographic. Yeah? Or if you look something else, it's not adding and weighing. It's, again, one reason, but it goes sequentially. So, in the literature, you, you read the lexicographic heuristics. Or yes, yeah, people do it, but the worst for them. Hmm? This is Keeney and Reifer, two very intelligent people, but they live in the world of risk. And uh, here is... Um, the analysis of the ecological rationality. So we pose a different question. We don't say lexicographic is bad because it's not like rational choice. No. It's an empirical question. And ecological rationality means find out the situation where lexicographic does better than something else and where it does worse. That's the real question. And for those he, uh, who want to know more about this, we will explain the minute there are two talks tomorrow at the Herbert Simon Society or the day after tomorrow by Konstantinos Katsikopoulos and uh, Oscar Simzek to go in lots of details. And this is uh, one of the wonderful, I think, totally new insights. Yeah? You actually can name the condition where you can do better with a simple lexicographic. So again, we use the... Um, the error composition in bias and variance. So variance is well understood from statistical theory. Increase your sample size, you need to use it. But sometimes you just can't increase it anymore. Bias is not well understood. And so we found that there are three conditions. Non-compensatorious dominance and cumulative dominance. I'll explain them in a minute. If any of these holds, uh, a lexicographic heuristic will have the same bias as any linear model. Note what that means. The linear models, in addition, suffer from variance. And then you can now predict that a simple lexicographic strategy will actually, different what Keeney and Reifer think, do better in prediction than linear models. And we found many cases. This is now the analysis. Now, what does this mean? non compensatorious dominance and cumulative dominance. Okay, take a deep breath, you will immediately understand it. Uh, non compensatorious can be easily explained. Think about a prediction situation where you have binary predictors, whether someone is uh, male or female, something like that. And there are five of them. Now think about a linear model. If the linear model, these are the weights of the linear models, they are uh, exponentially decreasing, like one, a half, a quarter, an eighth, and so on. You can easily see that a lexicographic model that goes just with the first reason hmm, will always lead to the same decision as any linear model. Because the other weights, even if they go in the other direction, they will never be higher. And if, if that is a tie, so this is a choice between two situations, then this will hold for the second thing. Huh? That's called non-compensatoriness. And that can be easily proved. Hmm? So what's been proved here is that it's equal. If that holds, hmm, then a lexicographic model will do as well in data fitting as any linear model, but better in prediction. Second one is dominance. Can you see that? We have a problem with the colors. Yeah. Maybe that's the next investment for the center. <laughs> so what you should see are gold coins and silver coins. There are two gold coins, there's one. This is the one alternative, that's the other alternative. And there are two silver coins and one, one silver coins. So, this option here dominates the other option. Dominates means that at least in one variable it has more and not more in any of the other one. That's simple. And you can also see immediately that you don't worry about weights or linear models. If it dominates, then just pick one reason that you're done. 
the third condition, cumulative dominance, is a little bit more complicated, particular if you can't see it. <laughs> it's what do I do? It's a situation where, uh, for instance, you have two golds and one gold here, and maybe uh, two silver and three silver over there. No, that would be, it's no dominance. Cumulative dominance means that you compare first this, the first variable with that one. So it dominates. And then you compare the sum of both, like four against, this should be three against four. That's okay. So it cumulatively dominates this. Yeah? And, and you can prove that uh, we can forget about that because you can see it anyhow. You can prove that uh, in, if any of these conditions hold, a simple lexicographic heuristic is nothing irrational. It actually will lead to the same result in fitting and better in prediction. And the last question is how often does this hold? And uh, Oscar did a study with 51 traditional AI uh, prediction tasks. So here are three, for instance, predict uh, how much uh, tip people give in a restaurant based on these variables. And the question was, in how many of these data sets holds one of the conditions? Here's the answer. You just look at the total, any one condition. If the data uh, predictors are numeric in 90% of all cases, and if they're binary in 97% of all cases. That is, a rational mind huh, can expect to be better by just doing something lexicographic. In particular, this doesn't include prediction. Yeah. So, let me uh, summarize. Ecological rationality, what does it mean? In situations of uncertainty, individuals face the problem of reducing estimation error. As I said before, we often talked about the human mind has computational limitation. That's not the point. We can't estimate things. That's the real point. Computation is easier. It can always take a computer. But I, the computer cannot estimate. It cannot estimate the wind huh, in the baseball players or other things. Second, estimation error can be reduced by simple heuristic. That's the point. Hmm? And you've seen where. And bias can be reduced by strategies that match the situation, this structure of the environment, as we had before, like dominance, cumulative dominance. So, um, this is the three, uh, four major messages, just to put it back into your mind. So, we dealt with decision-making under uncertainty. And decision-making under risk is not the same as decision-making under, under uncertainty. You need different tools, and you also, uh, need to understand that the best model in a world of risk, like Markowitz, is not the best one in a world of uncertainty. Second, heuristics are indispensable in a world of uncertainty. They are not the product of a flawed mental system. Of course, heuristics can also err, yeah? but optimization, optimization models can also err. That's not the point. And if you have heard this story about system one and system two, yeah, I mean, it's the nadir of psychological theorizing, yeah, and it misses the entire point. Yeah. There's no, no ecological rationality in it, and the heuristics are not yeah, the product of a flawed mental system one. Simplicity. Yeah. And finally, I've shown you about many conditions where less is more. And there's an analytical way to understand uh, that less is more. And I hope that this trip in the world of decision-making under uncertainty has uh, brought you back ideas, have not gone into the uh, actual practical applications. I will do this more tomorrow. And has also reminded me that it's not as easy to blame other people to be irrational. And it's not as easy to think about rationality as just consistency. But we need to rethink and take Herbert Simon's message seriously about the pair of scissors. We need to analyze what is the world we're talking about and what strategies will uh, be successful and stop thinking that more complex is always better or optimization is always better. 
This is the past of decision-making. The future are you. Thank you.